waiting for Paul to come back. You know? Compassion is paramount. There exists a place that goes beyond the ordinary. It's not just about responding swiftly in times of crisis. It's about being a beacon of hope during life's most challenging moments. It's not just about treating an illness. It's about engaging your child's imagination and turning their visit into a memorable adventure. It's not just about a diagnosis. We make it our mission to ensure that you fully understand your condition while going out of our way to simplify medical jargon. It's not just about serving meals, it's about nourishing your body and soul with delicious and nutritious food tailored to your dietary needs. It's not just about maintaining cleanliness, it's about a pristine and hygienic space that promotes healing and well-being. It's not just about performing a surgical procedure, it's about meticulous planning and executing each step with precision and expertise. Our team of doctors, nurses and support staff work in harmony, driven by the belief that exceptional healthcare is a combination of expertise and heartfelt compassion. Welcome to Clinics, where health and care meet. Oh, good evening, colleagues, and welcome to our weekly webinars uh, hosted by Clinics Health Group. And we're excited to have you once more joining us to share on the wisdom and thoughts and expertise and experience that we obtained from the various speakers who are part of us at here at Clinics Health Group. And we're excited once more to bring in you one of the speakers who's quite an experienced academic and clinician in the sphere of medicine where they're practicing. And so this evening, we, as usual, we, we have the CPD accredited webinars uh, that we request that you, when you join in and log in, you provide us with your full details so that um, we capture your information that you can submit for submission of your CPD points, uh, whether you are registered with the HPCSA or the Nursing Council or Pharmacy Council, um, and even if you are to register with any association or a regulatory body, we welcome all the other colleagues who are managers in the hospitals and other colleagues who want to get information about uh, recent trends in the advancement of medicine. And so this evening, we have one of our speakers uh, who's a clinician who's working with us at Clinics Health Group, who's Dr. Musa Kotla Mudise, who's a diagnostic and interventional radiologist. He's also a partner, director Dr. Marshall Chikawaya, incorporated practicing at uh, Phoenix Health Group hospitals across Houting province. 
He's also a member of the South African Interventional Radiology Society. And uh, Dr. Munisa has obtained his Bachelor of Medicine and Surgery in 2005 from the University of Pretoria. He further completed his Master's of Medicine in Diagnostic Radiology MED in 2016 from Sefa Kumakwa to Health Sciences University. Further completed his Peripheral Embolization Training Certificate in 2023 at Sakura City Hospital, that's what he wants to talk about this, uh, this evening. And so the topic for discussion this evening that he will be leading us on is uterine artery embolization. Uh, it's one of the topics that we've engaged in quite a lot uh, in the hospital and within clinics, and we are glad that uh, uh, tonight he's sharing this information, not only within clinics, but uh, with other colleagues and associates across the clinical spectrum. And so we are excited to have you, Dr. Mudise, in our midst this evening uh, to share your thoughts. Apologies that you are on low shading, uh, but we hope that uh, very soon we'll get to our power back. Thanks, Dr. Mudise. Thank you, Dr. Mudise. He was with us just a few minutes ago. Yeah, there, Dr. Munise. Oh, he, he was out. So just uh, admitting, you know, I think load shedding is playing games on us. Hi, Dr. Munise, you're back, back with us. If you can just unmute yourself and uh, switch on your video. Uh, so, colleagues, I don't know. What's, uh, let me just. Uh, come. Yes, I connected again. Hi, Dr. Melissa. Yeah, I can see that yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Um, can you help with the video as well, Dr. Abila? Because I can't start the video on my side. It says the host is blocking me. Uh, let me see what this looks like. Kamu is also gone. Yeah, he said, I just called him now. He said, it's the generator issue on the side. Oh, he's not in also. So I have to take charge of everything now. Sorry, let me just... Uh... So colleagues, we, we apologize for this glitch. Uh, load shading has taken over this evening and we, we just want to get uh, this... Uh, the presentation that we can share for Dr. Um, what do you say? I just need to start sharing your screen then. Dr. Bila, you have access to the presentation on your side? Yes, I'm, I'm 
Time to get the presentation. Okay. You're about to see the presentation is coming, no? Yes, it does. Um, but I don't have video from my side. I don't know if I can proceed without a video display. Um, let me see. You don't have a video on your side? Yeah. Okay, that's yeah. just... Uh, okay. Can you enlarge the screen? Because we see... Can you display it fully? Can you see it now? Yeah. Yes, that's perfect. Yes. Thank you. Thank okay. you, Dr. Bila. Yeah. Um, thanks, everyone, for joining this uh, wonderful meeting, uh, one of the clinics uh, hosted weekly meetings. Um, I'm Dr. Modisa, pregnancy cardiologist and the interventional work at Lesedi Clinics Hospital, uh, known as Dr. S.K. Matzike. Um, for, I just wanted to take a minute to just briefly describe the kind of uh, role that interventional radiology uh, play in terms of management of, uh, of the patient in the hospital. So as much as we cover diagnostic work, um, I'm a partner in the practice uh, covering the four hospitals. So the name of the practice is Dr. Marshall and Zichawia Incorporated. Um, I've been with the practice since 2017. Uh, just briefly to look at uh, focus, zoom in and what's the role of interventional radiology, which I think is more important to introduce um, because we always have the perception that diagnostic, I mean, radiologists just sit and just do the report. So I just wanted to elaborate a bit on it, um, the kind of procedure that, that we do before I dwell into the main topic of today, which is, um, inter which is uterine fibroid uh, embolization, which we're doing it because it's a fibroid awareness month. So um, diagnostic radiologists do uh, interventional work as well, uh, which is my area of interest, which we perform minimal invasive procedures using what we know very well, which is imaging guidance. So we do procedures under ultrasound, we do procedures under DSA of uh, our angel in cath lab, which we share with the cardiologist. We do procedure in our screening room called fluoroscopy. We do CT and image guided procedures as well. So the, the, our role is not only about diagnosis, but we, we do manage patients that needs procedures to be done. Can you move to the next screen? So interventional radiologist's role is to do non-vascular and vascular procedures. So in terms of endovascular procedure, procedures, we do um, access via arterial or venous uh, using image guidance to do uh, procedures of interest, which I'll dwell in in a second. And the non-vascular procedures that everyone is aware of is then uh, the procedures that we do in the department as we referred by the clinicians. For example, we do um, all sort of biopsies from thyroid breast and um, liver and kidney. So, and we also insert drainages uh, in the pleural space or abdominal collections that clinicians usually refer to us because it's easier under imaging guidance. And if you move in, if you, uh, we, there's, a, there's another way of doing procedures under CT guidance. For example, the oncology patients that have um, renal tumors, we can do what we call CT guided cryoablation for them. We also do CT guided lung biopsies, which are difficult for cardiothoracics to access. We do uh, do them under um, CT to actually um, go in with the procedures. Next slide, please. So I'm just going to touch a bit on the long list. I know it's a long list, but just to highlight a few of the procedures that we do before I get into the cracks of uterine artery embolization. So just um, in terms of arterial work that I'm currently doing at our cath lab, we, we do get procedures like um, thyroid embolization for those patients that have nodular guaita that are not suitable for surgery. Um, I've done one child who had recurrent uh, pistaxis, which are not resolving after multiple intervention from the ENT surgeon, and we, we have done what we call stenopalatine artery embolization. Uh, patients that are having TB with hemoptysis, in our environment, we know that TB is very common. We can do, we can assist with doing bronchial artery embolization for those patients. Um, I'm moving into the process of thrombolysis as well, which is a new technique of treating invasively patients that pre present with PE. In our radiology department, we know that um, on average we do two to three patients on a daily basis with positive PE. So there's new technology of treating those patients in, with minimal access to the pulmonary arteries to, to, um, to thrombolize those, those uh, clots that patients has. And one of my own 
my other interest is to assist uh, oncologists with patients that have um, liver tumors and metastasis to the liver, which with a direct embolization of those lesions in the liver, with a which, with a procedure that we call TACE. Um, there's another uh, procedure. There's a whole list of the things that I do, but of interest today, I'll just focus on the one that is the most common the one that we do in our department that is called uterine artery embolization. It's done in our cath lab. You can move to the next slide. You can proceed that next slide. Thank you. So that's the, the topic of today. It's called uterine artery embolization. The other name is called uterine fibroid embolization. But I prefer to you call uterine artery embolization because there are many conditions that we treat besides fibroids using this procedure. Can you move to the next slide? Next slide, thank you. So uterine artery embolization is a minimally invasive, like I said in the introduction, is a minimally invasive procedure that we use for treatment of predominantly symptomatic uterine fibroids, which uh, most of the patients present with. So all the patients are referred by the gynecologist. We don't have, any, we don't get our patients directly from the streets or being done by the GP or referred by the GP. So all of our patients are worked up by gynae and the gynecologist give the patient an option of this treatment as an option treatment, they discuss it with the patient. So our patients are referred, which is the most important that I want to highlight is the collaboration between us, uh, interventional radiologists and gynecologists to decide which patients come to me for that option of uterine artery embolization. Can you move to the next slide, please? So these patients present, uh, so the indication for this procedure is basically, like I said, commonly symptomatic fibroids, but patients that present with postpartum hemorrhage and the gynecologists are struggling to maintain the bleeding, um, we, we can move in and, and assist with uh, postpartum hemorrhage as well. I've done one patient last year that presented not with fibroids, but the vascular malformation of the uterus, which patient done well after embolization. The most common pathology that the gynecologists struggle with diagnosis and management is adenomyosis. And we have, there's a lot of literature that uh, confirm that these patients can, um, can uh, benefit from doing embolization. I've done quite a few with uh, a referral from the, one of the gynecologists at Bocillo, which we have seen that if you put this patient under this treatment, the, the, the symptoms clear out of, uh, from, from, um, from embolization. And we know literature that uh, the, those abnormal ad adenomyosis tissues tend to respond very well to, ad uh, to embolization. Um, in terms of pelvic congestion syndrome, which is which is not really is not arterial, which is venous, which is venous malformation, we do embolization um, via the femoral vein as well to go into the ovarian veins and and call these patients. I've done one patient uh, from a surgeon two months ago, which has responded very well from this treatment. Next slide. So any, like any other surgical procedure um, in, 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 in our profession of health, there is contraindication, which some are absolute, some are relative. We know that with patient, we can perform these procedures with a pregnant patient. Uh, previous slide up. Can you go back a bit? Thank you. We know that we can perform procedure, this procedure in patient which who present uh, with a signs of pregnancy or confirmed pregnancy. We don't perform this procedure with in a malignancy proven patients or patients present with pelvic infection. So we the patients, those uh, kind of um, conditions have to be cleared up by a gynecologist before the patients are referred to us. Uh, because we use contrast media when we do the angiogramming theater, we always do renal function to exclude that the patient has renal failure because, um, because of, of a proven um, contrast-related nephrotoxicity. So the renal failure patient are relatively excluded from this procedure. Um, from the history pre-procedure pre as well, we need to know if there's any contrast-associated allergies, which we need to prepare the patient before the procedure. And in terms of literature, we know that the patient with the type of fibroid, which we call subserosal pedunculated, the one that hangs within the uterine cavity, if it has a short neck, less than two centimeters, it tends to be contra, it's a relative contraindication because I have done a few patients with this kind of fibroid, which, which were more than two centimeters, but you end up having to do DNC for this patient because um, the fibroid stock broke. So 
uh, literature, they advise not to proceed with this procedure if the fibroid neck is less than two centimeters, but um, we've seen otherwise even with a bigger neck fibroids. Um, cervical fibroid is proven to be having a poor vascularity, therefore respond poor to the treatment. So we, we tend to advise against doing UFV for this procedure for this patient that presents with cervical type fibroid. Okay, move to the next page. So for us um, doing this procedure, it's important to identify the type of fibroids that you're dealing with. Like I said, uh, the pedunculated submucosal, I have a relatively contraindicated for this procedure, but most of the types that you see, which is uh, most patients presents with subserosal, intramural and submucosal type. So those are the common types of fib fibro type that we, we see with these patients that are coming through to us. Uh, we can move to the next page. So as you know, most of these patients present with uh, what you call gynecologist called menometrorrhagia, which is uh, painful, heavy periods. Uh, patients will commonly uh, present with the history of having heavy periods with clots, um, fresh blood with, mixed with clots. Uh, most of these patients with larger uh, fibroids around eight to 12 centimeters present with um, pressure symptoms, which have which they'll report uh, urinary frequency or retention. They've got back pain because the uterus will be markedly and large compressing on the, on the um, lumbosacral region. Patients will have paresthesia or leg pains because of uh, sciatic nerve compressions or they'll, they'll uh, give a history of painful intercourse. Next page. So as we all know, there are different modalities of treatment of these patients. Most commonly, the patients, uh, the gynecologists will dis dis discuss with this different mode of treatment for these patients. Uh, interventional radiology fall in the middle, uh, uh, middle box there, which um, we could do uterine embolization for these patients. Or um, at, they said there's another option of called high view whereby the patient, uh, the, the Technician use ultrasound focal point to actually treat this patient. This fibro is called fibroid ablation or HIFU. Um, the other surgical options are well known to everyone, which uh, the gynecologist will uh, assist the patients with that or medical options. Can you move to the next page? So here is the most important point if you compare uh, uterine artery embolization and the surgical options that are usually um, afforded to the patient. The advantage, the first uh, important advantage of this is preservation of the uterus, um, which most of the patients, when you give them this option, they, they'll call, especially elderly, so really want to uh, not to undergo hysterectomies. They'll tell you that I'm only doing this for, for preservation of my uterus. Um, symptomatic management, uh, decreased bleeding, pain and pressure symptoms, uh, short stay in the hospital we only admit patient 24 hours um, and if you go if you check into the european system these patients are actually done and, and and not admitted in the hospital they just get discharged in the same day post treatment um whereas in our setting obviously because of cultural issues um we keep our patient one day in the hospital for pain pain management and in terms of um duration post procedure we know that on average between 14 and 21 days, these patients are relatively um, fit to go back to work as compared to six weeks of my myomectomy. We, we have fewer complications as compared to open surgery. Um, so there's immediate physical and emotional improvement of this patient because post-procedure, post they can walk around in the ward, they can have a conversation, they can eat, they can move around. Like I said, most of them can actually go home the same day. And in South Africa, if you look at the the, the um, in terms of interventional procedure, this is the most covered procedure uh, by most medical aid. Today, I did a patient um, for very strangely, I mean, Sasonki is not one of the common medical aids, you know, it's a smaller group scheme, but they do they do cover these procedures as well. So most of the, there's no medical aid that I know that doesn't actually fund this procedure. Next image. So pre-procedure, I do a pre-procedure consult with these patients where I 
I interviewed them in terms of to find out the quality of life associated with the symptoms of the of, of their procedure. Or most of my patient, uh, because medical most of the medical schemes cover MRI scanning, I do um, pre-procedure MRI, which actually I'll, I'll demonstrate on the follow-up slides the role of MR on these patients. This procedure, these patients can be done uh, post ultrasound assessment as well, because uh, fibroids can be um, confirmed on ultrasound, but adenomyosis, there's very few chances of anyone making a diagnosis for adenomyosis on ultrasound. So these patients benefit mostly with MR. So most of my patients, I do them after uh, MR examination. Uh, most of my patients uh, go under, we do a detailed assessment of this patient, uh, make patients sign consent from a procedure. And we do basic blood like any surgical procedure, foot blood count and UNE. And for us as radiologists, UNE is important because we know that contrast can affect the, the renal function. So those are the basic blood that I do. We do pre meds which is done by the anesthetists who assist me with this procedure. We, patients are given anti-emetic, antibiotics, and anti-inflammatory uh, medication pre-procedure. So we move to the next slide. So I just wanted to highlight, I know most of most people are not familiar with MR image, but um, for, for us for workup of this patient, MR help us to confirm firstly the, the, the fibroid. It gives more information about the type of fibroid and it gives the exact volume of the fibroid. So it uh, it gives it, it, we even get the prediction of response based on the MR finding of this patient, and it helps us to exclude. Uh, miss malignancy of this patient. So it gives more details compared to ultrasound. We can assess the ovaries more in details. You get uh, information about the volume of the ovaries. If there is any adnexal pathology that was missed on ultrasound, we pick it up on, on MR. Can you move to the next page? And um, like I said, MRI plays a significant role because we know that there's a specific sequence that I, that we use called T2-weighted sequence. We know that uh, fibroids with high, high, uh, high signal intensity on, on T2-weighted sequence tend to respond better on, on, on uh, embolization. And the ones when you give uh, gadolinium, which is the contrast media that we use for MRI, they tend to respond very well. So people always ask, why do MR? So this, this is a significant role that MR plays in terms of working up for this patient, making sure that um, the, the kind of patient that we're selecting for this procedure will benefit from it. Can you move to the next slide? So I just wanted to uh, make a point about this approach that, that I use that was developed that we confidently accept that we have stolen from the cardiologist, but um, previously the radiologist used to do what we call femoral access, but we have progressed and, and followed suit with um, doing transradial, which is more beneficial for the patients and for the, for the doctor doing the procedure. Um, now lately, I'm one of those guys who are actually doing what we call distal uh, radial approach, which is more on the anatomical snuff box which helps with good stasis post, you know, your patients don't bleed, they can move around easily. So the advantage of doing transradial as compared to femoral, so it's just, just a comparison between the access point that we use for this procedure. With radial, um, the patient can, like I said, there's low risk of bleeding. So even with abnormal platelet patient, you can still do this access. Um, patients move immediately, there's no discomfort of groin, so a short hospital stay. So, um, and the, the, the other advantage is that with, you know, uh, with uh, patients that have high BMI, it's easier access than going to the femoral region. And one of the advantage of radial access is that you don't have to use Foley's catheter for these patients because the procedure becomes shorter. And there's a specific device. So post-procedure, you don't even have to waste time compressing as, as we used to do with femoral access. There's a closure device that immediately post-procedure you can put it and the patient can walk, go to the ward, you know, mobilize immediately for, uh, after the ward. And it saves uh, theater time as well because uh, you can use the uh, compression device. Can you move to the next slide? So the disadvantage about radial access is that um, it requires intensive training. 
like I said, I know most of my interventional radiology colleagues still prefer to do proximal because the vessel is smaller and actually difficult to, to access. We're talking about a two millimeter on average uh, diameter of a vessel. So you can imagine um, the access will be much more difficult to compare to the femoral access, which is 20 times the size in terms of diameter as compared to the radial, radial uh, artery. And the, the vessel is prone to what you call a vascular spasm. It can happen within the procedure. It can happen after the procedure. And we know in terms of literature that um, the, any injury to this vessel, the patient can develop what you call a fistula or a shunt um, associated with access, um, radial access. Can you move to the next slide? So what we do to prevent this uh, spasm that can develop in this patient, we have what you call a radial cocktail, which is used by cardiologists as well to, to preserve the, 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 um, you know, the vasodilatation of this patient. We mix those um, distant drugs to make sure that the, the radial artery remain patent uh, within the procedure and post-procedure. You can move to the next slide. So in terms of the actual procedure, um, this, uh, with, this procedure can be done under sedation, it can be done under general anesthesia, but we've seen with uh, um, the number of patients that we have done, uh, that it's better for you to put the, the patient under GA because then it makes your life and the patient's life easier. Um, so what I do is I, I put a small catheter which, are, which is four French, it's 125 centimeters long in the radial artery. Uh, so in the hand, you've got uh, you've got option of using the radial and ulna, but we know anatomically that the radius is, is bigger. So we put the long catheter there, um, which was developed. Most of the companies now have the 120, 25 centimeter length catheter, or up to now, up these days for the prostate, they have developed even the 120, 180, sorry, centimeter length catheters. So the main concept about it is to access the radial artery um, and go to the you turn actually via the subdeviant, thoracic aorta, abdominal aorta, and until the bifurcation and the iliac vessels until you access the uterine artery, which is done under fluoroscopy. So then we inject medication, which is called uh, embosphere, which is of gelatin of product within the particles. And this particles role is to actually block the, the channel of the blood channels that supplies the fibroids and cause necrosis, shrinkage and softening of the fibroid. So I always inform patients in terms of the duration. We know that the symptoms improves relatively immediately post procedure. And we know that um, generally we say that when the patient comes back after three months, we expect at least a minimum of 40%, 40 shrinkage of this fibroid. 90% of this patient do not need the treatment. I have I had one or two patients that required um, re-embolization, but most of the patients um, give relatively good response to this treatment. Next slide. Please. So this is just a schematic representation of what I was just describing there. You can see a small syringe there on the radius. So basically it's, it's our access point. Go through the radial artery, go up. You can actually see anatomical there and just until you get to the uterine artery, you can go to the next slide. So this is a zoomed in image of the actual position of the catheter that I'm using in the uterine artery and injection of uh, embospheres. We use different size. We always start with a smaller size so that can penetrate deeply into the fibroid. We use 500 micrometers, which is the common one that we use. And we top it up with seven to 900, which are much more bigger particles for bigger vessels. So the aim of, of Post-procedure, how do you know that you have completely treated the fibroid is when you get what we call near stasis, where only the proximal um, uh, uterine artery still feels when you, when you inject contrast. So we don't want to see any blush go into the fibroid. Then you know you have achieved your complete embolization. You can move to the next slide. So this is the DC DSA image that I um, just wanted to show to everyone. So you can see that the UA, UA there is a uterine axis on the left image. So that's post-treatment. On the right, it's just a zoomed in image to, to show the, the white arrow there. That's how the fibroid, pre, the uterine artery looks pre-embolization. So we know that the fibroid arteries are always those small screw kind of image uh, 
uh, vessels on the right, which are small, and the one, the white arrows there demonstrate the curved area there. So if you compare with the, with the image on the right, you can see that, on the left, sorry, you can see that the, just the proximal, that look, that's just filling on, on post-treatment. So we basically uh, inject the medication, and then when you do your, your follow-up run, you expect to see the image on the left. You can go to the next one. Can I skip this slide up? Thank you. So this is another close look. So what you call, this is what you call a five red blush. So when you inject the initial um, contrast before you embolize, that's exactly uh, showed by those uh, arrows there. So you actually see the actual five point with a specific blush. Um, if you do MR, okay, previous image, please. Just we'll come to this one. Okay, so this is just to see, to demonstrate to everyone what we want to achieve post post treatment. Um, so the image on the left is before treatment and the image on the right is after treatment. So it's they just demonstrating the nest thesis that I highlighted earlier. So the aim is to inject medication and then get uh, to achieve the image on the right side. Can you move to the next slide? So all my patients, so this, here's a specific role that I wanted to demonstrate with, uh, with MR. So we do what you call pre preembolization MRI, which is image A and B. So it's a non-contrast T2 and a post-contrast uh, T1 fat set on image B. So when you do follow up, uh, what you expect to see specifically looking at image D, compare image D and image B, you can see that there's uptake of contrast where the, the fibroid is, is depicted by the white arrow in image B. So the black arrow in image D demonstrate what we want to achieve, which is necrosis. So the, the, the fibroid won't be taking up contrast because of no vascularity to the fibroid. So exactly what we want to show. And you can actually see that there's huge significant in size that difference. So if, this is what we expect after three months post-treatment. So uh, uh, we confirm necrosis after three, three months and we confirm reduction in size and clinically assessing the patient to find out um, the questionnaire that you find that the symptoms have significantly improved. You can move to the next slide. So post-procedure, we keep these patients in the ward. Um, we give them intravenous analgesics because of the necrosis process. These patients will experience pain. Um, we, the sisters are advised to monitor, to monitor the puncture site, which now, um, since radial, there's no even necessity for the sister to manage to, to look at the puncture site because this, the, the, the hemostasis band are removed, are deflated and removed within an hour post-procedure. So there's no issues with bleeding post-procedure. And patients are discharged on oral medication and prophylactic antibiotic treatment. I do six weeks follow up and three months follow up MR with patients that can actually follow, I mean, afford follow up MRI. Otherwise, most of the patients, depending on the, on the medical aid option, we just do um, ultrasound follow up, which is adequate for, for reviewing all these patients. Next, please, next slide. So as, as like any other procedure, as much as I said that there's minimal complications as compared to open surgery, we still get um, complications associated with this procedure. Um, I've done over 400 patients. I only had one spasm. <laughs> so that is, I've been treated there in the back as one patient. Uh, but the main thing is to be able to manage these patients because with spasm, you have to make sure that if, if it's intra-procedure, my spasm was post-procedure, so my sheath was already removed, so there was no way I could administer um, medication to, to actually assist in vasodilation. So post-procedure, you have to you know, follow up in imaging, specifically this patient. Um, we did deep ultrasound um, assessment with a small probe to see if there's any recannulation. We did CT um, angiogram of the arm of the limb, which showed that it was just a short, uh, short spasm. So um, 
the, the main thing is to be able to manage the complication. Commonly, this patient presents what we call post embolization syndrome. I'll give more detail about it. Um, I had one patient which, uh, the, like I said, the stock issue is still controversial. The patient has a submucosal fibroid, which had a stock of four centimeter, but within 72 hours, we had uh, the gynecologist had to do DNC to actually deliver this fibroid. So they actually do break. So, but um, theoretically, we know that it has to be around two centimeters, but my neck was four centimeters, but we still experienced um, breakage of the fibroid. Um, patients develop commonly UTIs, you know, patients sometimes, you give them prophylaxis and they don't take them. Um, the other uh, documented complications in the literature, which is very rare, premenopause, which is very rare, but it's documented on our literature. There's only one case in Europe where there was complete necrotic uh, necrosis of the uterus. So it's a very rare complication. Can you move to the next page? So like I said, the post embolization syndrome is very common. Um, it's basically uh, a immune response to the medication that we inject to this patient. In most of the time, patients reported a few days post procedure, which we just want, we just uh, manage symptomatically. So the patient will present with flu-like symptoms, they'll have pain, fever, nausea, and we just treat them with analgesics uh, and anti-inflammatory medication. There's always good response. Um, next page. So I just wanted to, there's just four articles that I want to pinpoint, which I, I think is relevant for, for this discussion, which um, for me, the most important one is this one that which I'm just gonna uh, point some few, few pointers on it. This was a study that was published in 2003, which compared the benefit um, of doing abdominal myomectomy as compared to embolization, which um, 111 patients were recruited, 44 underwent myomectomy, and 67 did embolization. And post follow up over a period of 30 months, they, they found out that uh, patients actually were better controlled, the menorrhagia or symptoms were better controlled with embolization as compared to myomectomy. Whereas myomectomy was much better in terms of uh, pressure, the, the patient that had bigger fibroids who had pressure symptoms. The myomectomy relieved or patient benefited much better quicker with myomectomy as compared to um, a uterine fibroid embolization. So in terms of comparison of the two, both of them um, improved quality of life depending on what was presented, uh, the patient presented with. Can you go to the next slide? The second article which I wanted to highlight is our lo local article, which was published by, uh, by Prof. Ahmed Estibico with Dr. Les Lawson and the team, which they looked at uh, a group of patients um, over a period of five years. So it was just a questionnaire kind of, uh, um, you know, uh, a research. Can you go to the next page? So basically they looked at um, 80, 82 patients uh, followed up over a period of five years. Um, basically it was a retrospective study looking at the, if the, the, the incidence of recurrence of treatment, reintervention of this patient, patient satisfaction and associated complications. And two patients required repeated embolization. I do have like, even for myself, I had two or three patients that required reembolization. Um, one of the patients re experienced recurrence out of the 82. Uh, no, repeat, no repeated myomectomy performed for this patient, but 80% 80, 80, 80 of them reported satisfaction post procedure. 12 patients of them were partially satisfied. I'm not sure what is partially satisfied, and seven are not satisfied. But there were no, any, no complications associated with UFE in this group. So I wanted to point out that even in South Africa, we still, you know, we do research, um, you know, for, for the procedures that we perform in interventional radiology. So the conclusion was that um, UFE was shown to be a good choice of treatment for symptomatic fibroids and a favorable one in a long-term outcome in the South African population. Can you move to the next slide, please? 
So this this one is a, just an Italian study published in 2018, which looked at a longer period um, um, of, of retrospective of assessment of this patient. So it looked at the efficiency and the safety of, of, of this procedure over a period of 15 years, which I think is, is you know, it's reasonable to, to actually go through. We can move to the next page. So this study recruited 255 patients uh, with symptomatic fibroids uh, who were like, candidates for myomectomy. Uh, it was followed up, like I said, it was a long-term one with, for, with a duration of two years of follow-up. And the results found that 78% um, of the patient had uh, like improvement or resolution of menstrual disorders. Only 14 had improvement. So most of them, the, the menstruation disorders that they presented with initially completely resolved. The pain disappeared in 66% of these patients and the significant improvement in the flow, like I said, menstrual disorder improved and the patients were not anemic, which is you know, most important as well. The, the total reduction of the volume of the uterus, so patients with pressure symptoms were, were benefiting is almost 60%. And we find that with these fibroids, as much as most of them present with multiple fibroids, there's always a dominant in the in, in dominant fibroid um, in, in the in the patient. So the dominant fibroid reduced predominant 76% of them have the reduction of a dominant fibroid. So looking at this study that was done over a period of five years, the condition was that it's an excellent alternative, like the one that was that I just um, noted from the South African uh, uh, study, and it's safe, tolerab tolerable, and effective for both short and long term. So these are the most important thing. And, and the evidence, there's also advantage of economic and social terms. So in terms of economic, we know that these patients, the only one they're in the hospital, they are back at work within two weeks as compared to six weeks of myomectomy. Socially, this patient has immediate improvement of symptoms. So next page, please. Okay, this is another study that actually combined, this is an American study looking at different um, centers and combining the data, which looks at a bigger group, 800 patients, which I think is, is a huge study to actually, you know, to, to assemble. So they look at a bigger group of patients that went, uh, 451 went for UFE and 412 did myomectomy. So they compared the two groups as well, the same as the first study. Can we move to the next page? So in terms of comparison between the two, this, they were, the condition of the study was that uterine atrial embolization is more effective in controlling patient symptoms and has lower rate of post-procedural blood transfusion. So there's more advantages to this procedure um, as compared to my anatomy. Can we move to the next slide? I just wanted to highlight on this article, which was published by, by a team of gynecologists and biologists, uh, which actually looked at a controversial issue, which is fertility post UFE. I know my gynecologists, colleagues, I'm sure that I blocked on our way waiting for this moment for me to touch on this one. But um, can you move to the next slide, Doc? I just wanted to give... Um, So this study actually looked at a big group of, of um, childbearing females that went under UFE. So it enrolled 398 patients. So they were monitored over a period of time to see how many of them were for pregnant. And they found that out of 398, 148 delivered, uh, you know, well babies, no issues. Um, can you move to the next page? I think I, I, I removed a bit of an article there. So on the on the previous article, the, the main thing is that uh, it's proven that people still fall pregnant, but they still need, we need, still need to do a lot of research in terms of um, fertility post UFE, which is a bit of a controversy if when we interact with our gynae patients. Um, there's no enough evidence to prove that patients do fall pregnant post UFE. Last article that I want to point at, which I actually um, distributed among, among my gynecologists. colleagues. So UFE can still be done with those patients that are still considered for myomectomy. So 
this in this article, the focus which was uh, published last year, the focus was to have three groups of patients do pre what you call pre uh, myelectomy embolization. Um, after a day, you can move to the next slide, doc. So the three groups enrolled three, I mean, the study enrolled three groups of patients. The one that were performed um, embolization within 20, um, 24 hours before my electomy. The second group uh, enrolled uh, 21 patients, which were done, sorry, into enrolled uh, 23 patients, which were done my electomy 19 days post procedure. And then the last group uh, was, not, was only done my electomy. Can move to the next slide. So if you compare the three groups, it was found that the group one, which is the one that we had done uh, embolization before my anectomy, I mean, uh, 24 hours before my anectomy, it was found that those ones were significantly lower risk of blood loss as compared to group two and group three. Group two was still risky because um, it was 19 days post embolization, so the, the recanalization of those vessels. So those patients were still having a risk of bleeding. As com but group three, we knew that uh, those patients were high risk of bleeding uh, post-procedure post because there was no pre-embolization. So there's a significant role we can, especially with those fibers that are um, around 10, 10 centimeters in, in diameter, we can do pre-embolization for, for the gynecologist to safely do uh, my electomy with, with minimal blood loss. So it, it, for me, I think this is very crucial because I know that my gynecologists colleagues always experience uh, bleeding issues post my electomy. So I always tell them that we can, with bigger fibroids, this is, will be a big advantage for them. We embolize them and within 72 hours, then they can go ahead and do their myelectomy. Last slide of the day before questions. So I just wanted to highlight um, one important factor. Um, the CAT lab at SK Mazzipi was opened in 2019. That's when I started doing UAP study in the theater. And to date, we have done a huge number of uterine fibro embolization, which is counting at 400. And with the company that I'm supplying, I'm, I'm registered as one of the top users in South Africa. So our CAT lab is very busy. So UFE is very big at Lesedi. That's the reason why I'm just displaying this, this uh, statistics. So with those numbers, I, I'm counting, like I, I ended up by saying we're moving. So in the next five years, I want us to double this number, which if you look at um, the number of UFEs done in other countries, in America, the UFE is a first line treatment for fibroid as compared to my myomectomy. Like any other thing else in life, we're moving slowly towards there. Thank you. Thank, thanks a lot, uh, Doc. Uh, it was quite a, an interesting presentation uh, that you've shared with us this evening. And um, this one, one colleague was not able to hear, but he was saying that he, he loves what he's seeing and reading on the screen. So it means even if he didn't hear, but he could still follow uh, the presentation because the slides were quite clear. And thank you, and thank you for doing that for us. Um, colleagues, we were battling a little bit tonight. Um, the team, the logistic team to support, they, they got bummed out because of load shedding where they were, they were, they were. so I've been ha having to manage, uh, uh, running the screens and showing us uh, the, the presentation, and at the same time, read the, uh, the, the questions in the chat box, but please do uh, post your questions in the chat box. There's a first question that Doc, um, Dr. Mdise, uh, someone does not agree with you about your uh, view that it says, uh, Return at symbolization and fertility impact. I'm of the view, that's Dr. Sifumba, that, that the procedure is not recommended for women who desire to maintain fertility. Uh, what's your comment on it? I know that you referred to your gynecology colleagues uh, at some stage during the presentation and you became animated when you spoke about your presentation or discussion on, on fertility. Uh, you, for the, just, um... I don't know if it's a direct or indirect response to that. Um, with the numbers like I've displayed, out of 400 patients that I've done, um, we have recorded many pregnancies post. 
So I'm not even going to talk about literature. I'm going to talk about my own experience. So we have patients that they fell pregnant, especially those patients that had adenomyosis and we treated them for, for adenomyosis with embolization. We have recorded a lot of pregnancies. So that is why I, I knew that when I highlight on that article, my gynecologist colleagues will be like, you know, up and about about it. But that's the latest, latest article that was published by a combination of gynecology and the IR in Europe. So I don't know if you compare, if you look at statistically, it was around 400 patients that they followed up and over 100 of them fell pregnant. So I don't know in terms of statistics, the one that I've done my make told me how often do they fall pregnant? It's, it's, it's for me, Dr. Pila, all I can say to my gynae colleagues is that it's a researching process. You know, we're doing a lot of research about it. We've got statistics about it, but more needs to be done, you know? That is why I'm saying, even for me, the number of VFUs that I'm doing, if I can group and look at the patients that are within the age bearing, there's a lot of data there to publish. I don't think it's a matter of argument. It's a matter of doing research about it and moving forward and see if it's benefit or non-beneficial. And just to add to, 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 um, to my point as well. So we have developed techniques that actually um, assist with the procedure in terms of minimizing particle flow to the ovaries. So we, we, we have, because most of the time when you do your initial run, you will see what we call anastomosis between the uterine artery and the ovarian artery. So if we visualize anastomosis, the vessels are relatively quite small. So if you, instead of starting with a 500, you start with a 700, which has much bigger particles and then they won't flow to the ovaries. The other option yeah. is, the other option is to put what we call coils. You put coils in the anastomosis vessels, so nothing flows to the ovaries. So that is why I'm, I'm highlighting that there's a lot of research being done. And with the experience of the group that I've done, there's a lot of, like there are techniques to minimize flow to the ovaries. And there are a lot of patients that have felt pregnant, but I agree with my gynecologist colleagues, they still need, needs, I mean, more research needs to be done. I don't think it's a matter of argument. It's a matter of, you know, putting our hands together, doing minimally invasive procedures for patients and look at the benefits and, 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 and take it from there. Great. So, so you, you, you prepared to work with the, with the guided colleagues to you know, collect your information and uh, when time comes to write a paper or publish information about, especially what you're doing at Dr. SK. I was looking at, I think the theater slate for your study today had a number of cases that you're doing on a daily basis. Yes, that theater is mine, uh, Dr. Bila. No one else but <laughs> <heard> that. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, I think we, we're looking forward to published information on, on the cases that you're doing. Next question is, is, is there any place for UAE in dysfunctional deterrent bleeding? Um, yes, definitely. Um, that if, you, if, you, if I just go back to my slides, um, so there are indications that we can do UFEs. Um, so patients that have, uh, for example, post-delivery, postpartum hemorrhage, there's a huge role of UFE in those patients in terms of, and like, I mean, if you compare, and I know that the gynees have ways of going and ligating the uterine arteries or use the balloon there. They, they still a huge role of, of, I've done two, three patients postpartum for my gynecologist colleagues, and the patient responded very well to those patients. Just one of the examples. So in terms of management of abnormal, abnormal uterine bleeding, there's a huge role. That's the reason why we do uterine artery embolization. Okay. Yeah, next question. I think it's in the, in the, in the, in the abbreviations that beat me, forgotten of what it means. But the question is, we, we can achieve amenorrhea with the use of GnRH antagonists prior to myomectomy, uh, what is the cost difference between UAE and GnRH antagonists? I think that question needs to be answered by Gaini. <laughs> 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 I, I don't, I don't administer any medication. I administer particles for patients. So you, GnRH, you, yeah, no. It, not it for reminds me when, when I had a chat with you and I say you. Uh, radiologists are technicians, and you said, no, no, we are clinicians also. Yeah, definitely we are, Doc. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, any kind of colleagues who's prepared to answer this question amongst the colleagues who are logged in? Is there anyone who, who can uh, venture to 
uh, respond to Dr. Sanka uh, because uh, Emenorea. Uh, but what is the cost of UAE? Maybe perhaps maybe that could give us an indication. Uh, um, uh, Dr. Bila, um, I know the, this one of the medical, just to answer the, the question briefly, um, the issue with UAE is that we use cath lab and everyone knows that cath lab usage is very expensive in the hospital setting. So I think this is what actually, um, you know, sort of give the impression that UAE is, is much more expensive than my electron because of, of the instrument yeah. that we use. But in terms of um, medication, there are different kinds of uh, particles that we use. Uh, these companies have developed so many different kind of, kinds of particles to, to, to administer to these patients. And the cheapest yes. one is called, PV, is called PVA. So more, I had cash paying patients where we actually worked it out. And, and, but um, we find that the hospital, the patient, the theater time, health lab is more expensive than you know a normal theater so that's what mark up you know or increase the cost of this procedure but if if you look at the the the, the procedure cost the, the the most burden is at the at the usage of the cath lab but in terms of radiology fee and the catheters the catheters are quite reasonable i mean the four french catheter is around 200 bucks a guide wise around 300 trends so the most the main cost of this procedure is is usage of cath lab in the hospital yeah. So I suppose Dr. Sankal uh, assumes, wants to argue that it, it, it is, in the light of what you said, the cost of cat lab, if you can achieve the same using uh, medication, why then opt for, uh, for, 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 for this procedure intervention, you know, uh, an invasive procedure like a, a UAE? I'm not sure in terms of Dr. Bila, in terms of uh, what the, 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 my colleague is, is, is pointing at, because I mean, we know with UFE, you basically, it's proven that if you treat the patients with embolization, patients are free of fibroids minimum of 10 years. I'm not sure if when, what you give, when, when you administer GL, that drug, how long are you really maintaining those fibroids? But in terms of what we do, I know that, I mean, I've been doing them for, for such a long time, I've never had a patient coming back with 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 fibroid issues. So I don't know in terms of administering supplementary medication or the medication that the doctor is talking about. If you compare how many times the patient has to come for retreatment as compared to once off treatment yeah. with UFE, I think that's an argument. Um, I'm not sure in terms of how much will it cost for a patient to keep on coming for treatment as compared to once off admitted embolized and go home and stay stay home for 10 years with no fibroid issues. Yeah, I hear you. Now, Dr. Karakuri, one of the, the colleague gynecologists wants, wants to know, she says that I know you mentioned that premature ovarian failure is rare, but can you elaborate on failure rates and how should you counsel patients with regards to this complication? Yes, uh, that's it. Thank you for the question, Dr. Karakuri. Um, if we look at the literature, um, there is a 7% chance of ovarian, premature ovarian failure, but which is the same as my amectomy. And I know my gynecologists colleagues don't like when I say this, but the, the effect of this procedure to the ovary is the same as them doing my amectomy. It's, it is written in the literature. So the risk is 7%, the same as my amectomy. It's the same. Yes, it's the same. Yeah. Okay, um, the next question is a uh, 25-year-old unmarried female uh, with 26 weeks size fibroid. Uh, would you recommend UAE? Uh, the question is incomplete, but I assume that's what they meant. Yes, so that's why I'm saying that this, this, uh, pro this is a collaboration between guidance and radiologists. It's not an individual decision. So what we do is all these patients are, are seen by a gynecologist. So a gynecologist will make that kind of recommendation for a patient, right? Because in terms of, uh, I, I, I can say the patient can, can be done UFE and post UFE done myomectomy. But if you mention that that size of a fibroid, that patient is prone to bleeding post myomectomy, which we have seen at SK. That patient is even prone to hysterectomy at that age. 
you know. So that, for me, I will say that um, the work is collaboration between the two teams and the guidance are the first line of assessment of this patient, you know. But we know that, I mean, there's cases that we know that a young patient, that my anatomy, end up with this anatomy. So my argument will be more subjective to what I'm doing, but we know that what happens to these patients, and there's always a risk. So there's a risk of even me doing UFE on that 26-year-old and having the, the, the effect on the ovaries, like Dr. Tavukul is asking. But my argument is the very same patient can go his directomy at that age, I mean, my amectomy, and end up with his directomy. So if you look at both situations, Dr. Pila, it can go either way. So at the end of the day, the guy is the one that has to sit down, cancel the patients of the advantage of each procedure, and decide with the patient, because at the end of the day, we want to give the best options to this patient. Okay. Oh, is that about Gospi, Dr. Karakul, or somebody else? Okay, um, but primarily what you're saying is that the, the, this, the, 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 the your, your patients, you, your source, or you get reference, reference from gynecologists primarily, or is it 100% of all, all your cases are referred by uh, your, your colleagues in gynecology, or you get other cases that are, uh, I see walk-ins or from GPs or from other uh, specialists or colleagues? So all 120% of my patients are referred by gynecologists. What I mean by saying that, Dr. Bila, even if the patient comes to radiology department referred by a GP and we, tell, we inform them about this procedure, they still, we still refer them to gynecologists. Like I said, this is a treatment option offered by gynecologists to patients, even with the medical aid authorization dog, all, all referrals have to be from gynecologists. So they, I don't even have a chance to get these patients for myself, you know? So they are all referred by gynecologists and I treat them post reviewed and be referred by gynecologists. Okay. So, so there's a pool of gynecologists who have got confidence in this procedure and they refer to you. That is why my number, I'm the highest in the country. Wow. So, okay, okay thanks. Yeah, that's, that's it's commendable. It, it's commendable quite uh, clearly. So it means that you don't only get your reference, reference from Dr. SK, but they are also outside of uh, this hospital. Can I give you the numbers, Doc? Out of sure. SK, out of SK, there's only two guys referring to me. Out of Houghton province, I've got 20 gynees. And out of 20 gynees, only four are in the clinic group. Oh, so we can encourage more colleagues to... to no, they're not interested. There. No, they're not Okay, let's, let's, let's not talk about, about that. Let's <laughs> <laughs> Politics. <laughs> no, 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 we're not having a private conversation, though. Okay. Um, they, 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 are we going back to Dr. Sanga? That he, he wants to go back. Maybe he could unmute himself. He says the purpose of the general antagonist is prior to myomectomy. And uh, this results in, in amenorrhea. The results in the recovery of the anemia are also, we, and will also result in less blood loss at the time of myomectomy. And the cost is approximately 5,000. So is, I think that's what, what he's saying that there's antagonist and myomectomy, and then compare this with the uh, UAE. Which one is cheaper at the cost of yeah, 5,000? So, yeah, so, you know, like what the other colleague is, is saying is interesting, but for me, you know what I always say when there's always different, you know, options to everything, it's, it's an opportunity to do research and actually sit down and, and collect data because, you know, South Africans, we, we're very lazy. You know, we always like making opinions, but there's an option, there's a, there's a way that we can share the information. We can sit down, me and him can write the paper comparing the two, you know? For me, that's what I believe in. I believe that it's an opportunity, let's stop, let's stop comparing, you know, by just argument, let's have the numbers on the table. You know what I'm saying? Because if we look at rent to rent of this procedure, it's, it's like, you can't look at it in one patient. You have to look at the overall in terms of managing that patient for 15 years. That is why I was, I was presenting those articles that look at the efficiency of this treatment over a long period of time. 
I, for me, I don't think let's you talk about 10,000, 5,000. I don't think it takes us anywhere. Okay. So I think you, 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 you should just uh, throw the gentleman to Dr. Sanga to say, let, let's do a search. Let's, let's put down an argument in a scientific way and, and, and compare. That's Thank you very much, Dr. Um, I, I don't know if it, it, anyone who wants to pose the question. We just way past seven. Sorry, I don't think you can hear me. Oh, uh, yes. Yeah, yeah. saying, 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 yeah. But thank you for your talk. Very interesting. And I do, re I do refer patients here in Durban for the procedure. What I was saying is that if you have a patient who requires a myomectomy, if you gave her the Zolodex, for example, reduce amenorrhea, allow the hemoglobin to recover, and do an interval myomectomy, now, that might take three to six months that you, 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 you would uh, do the procedure, the three to six months later that you would do the procedure. So what I want to know from a practical point of view now, should I give my patient uh, Zolodex, uh, wait for amenorrhea and then do a myomectomy, or should I refer for the procedure that you are talking about in terms of the UAE and then uh, plan uh, a myomectomy, which would be cheaper in that in that circumstances, not the 15 year outcome, but for the immediate um, uh, yeah, management of the patient. Thank you. Uh, okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the question, Doc. I, I understand where you're coming from. So obviously, because the, the, the UFP entails admitting patient using cath lab, it will be more costly than just administering medication and taking a patient for my anectomy. So from my point of uh, interventional radiology, I would say that obviously the UFP will be much more expensive. But that is why I was talking about long term, because then if you're talking about if you if it's just for pre-myomectomy, for, for me, like uh, I'm saying, if you just administer medication with evidence that it will minimize bleeding, then it will be definitely much cheaper as compared to pre-myomectomy -embol pre embolization I highlighted earlier. Thank you. Okay. Okay, maybe before we, we lock off, we've got two more questions, Dr. Mudise. I know that colleagues have not seen you. If you switch on your video, that they can just have a, a view who we, we're talking to. Dr. Joseph wants to know the fibroid will undergo necrosis, which then develop into serous fluid. How long will this last? Is it a problem? Suppose that's after UAE. Okay, thank you for the question, Doc. Um, so, we, they, there's a lot of research which is virtually done about that. So what we usually say is that this, like if we can go back at my, at my uh, previous slides, they have highlighted that with post, after necrosis, uh, so the fibro relatively softens up and reduces in size. So the rate of reduction, we always say it's one centimeter a month. So hence for me, I always do the three months MRI follow-up, which will confirm necrosis and reduction in size. So with literature, we always say that within 18 months of post-procedure, the UFE should have completely resolved or shrunk completely. Okay. Now, thanks to the Dr. Supercia. Last question is, is, is there a limit on the size of the fibroid that one can embolize? Thank you for the question. So the recommendation is to do less than 10 centimeters. If it's more than 10 centimeters, we recommend UFE and then my myomectomy post. So what you call debulking because the fibroid will be bigger with many vessels. So then you minimize the bleeding, but there, we know literature wise that less than 10 centimeter results very well with UFE. That's my answer. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, so we, I'm going to ask Dr. Kenoshi and Ms. Kenoshi just to do the final comment before we close. Thank you very much, Doctor. Thank you very much, Doctor Bila. I think a special thank you to Doctor Musa Kutla Mudise for very, really educating us today, uh, letting us know about uh, fibroid, uh, uh, um, uterine fibroid, uterine artery uh, embolization. Um, I think it's one of those procedures, the newer procedures in relatively 
that would help a lot of our patients, especially in Africa. I remember reading somewhere that uh, 75 to 80 percent of women develop fibroids uh, to to varying degrees, of course. And uh, so it means just it just shows you how common fibroids are in in uh, uh, amongst our, our women in Africa, especially. Um, so we really thank you, uh, Doc, for having um, educated us on this. Uh, even those who are in the in, in the same trade as you are, I think um, I'm glad that they joined and they shared their own um, experiences and information. Um, we thank um, your doctor group, um, Dr. Smashau and Tisauza and Tisauya and, and, um, and, 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 and Incorporated, which um, you are a director in, uh, for being associated with clinics. And uh, we, I know you you run radiology services in um, uh, four or four, five acute care hospitals. And uh, I think we're glad to, that you've been with us for some years, uh, providing new um, fields in radiology, not only in imaging, but also in uh, interventional radiology, as you've, you, you've covered uh, uh, earlier today, uh, over and above uh, uterine artery em embolization. Uh, thank you very much, Doc, for sharing your time, your knowledge uh, with, with us. I see, I, I noticed that at, at the height of uh, attendance this evening, there were uh, 261 participants. And we thank the participants also for registering and logging in to the weekly clinics webinars. Uh, we do this for a good cause as, as clinics free of charge um, for our doctors population in the country and um, uh, I know it also helps in uh, in, in um, obtaining um, uh, CPD points for your continued registration with the Health Professions Council of, of South Africa. Uh, this happens automatically as soon as you 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 you, you register and you you, you, you give us your registration Thank you very much for muting. Um, I noticed in the chats, Dr. Bila, that quite a number of people tend to write the in, in the chats their registration number. It is not necessary. And somebody asked whether it is, is it, should they all do that? Should, is it necessary to, to, to write in your, uh, in the chat, uh, uh, your, your, your registration number is not necessary at all. As we will capture your, your, your registration number with the, with the council uh, as you register, as long as you provided that to us, I think that's enough. But thanks very much, Dr. Bila. I think over to you uh, to, for closure. Thanks for stepping in this, this evening as we were struggling at the beginning of the presentation with Camu being uh, Camu for marketing and managing our the, the uh, logging in uh, who has not been able to stay with us uh, since uh, because of load shedding. And just to thank everyone else, uh, colleagues and to come this and everyone who's logged in next week, uh, we are proceeding with this kind of presentations. We'll be going into dentistry. We'll be looking at our dentists doing presentations and look forward to an exciting uh, discussion again next week. And um, have a great week and good evening. Thank you.